It is good to see everyone here this morning. Uh, next week is Christmas Day, and we will be doing our services as normal. Nothing will be different, nothing will be changed, the times will not be changed. And so we hope that uh, if you have any relatives or friends that have come in for the holidays, that you will invite them to worship service, uh, especially if they're not members of the Lord's Church. Here's an opportunity for us to invite them to come and see how New Testament Christians worship and an opportunity to teach them by invitation. If they, and if they will not come with you, tell them, we'll see you when we get back. Come to worship God and show them the example of putting first things first. Putting the kingdom first. Psalm 90 is a unique psalm. We're going to look at this psalm this morning. It is a unique psalm, psalm because it is a psalm of Moses. Moses wrote this psalm according to the heading of this verse, verse 1. It's the prayer of Moses, the man of God. This is the only psalm that we have in our book of Psalms written by Moses. That makes Psalm 90 the oldest psalm of the collection of psalms. Moses, of course, lived before David, before those others who wrote the psalms. And therefore, it is the oldest in the collection of psalms. And we're going to see some wonderful truths uh, that are found here in this psalm. In Psalm 90, verses 1 and 2, we see that God is an eternal refuge. God is an eternal refuge. Moses writes, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And so we see that Moses, writing by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he is writing here praising God and talking about God being our dwelling place in all generations. Uh, some translations might say refuge, a place to go for protection, a place to go to find a blessing. God is a refuge for His people. And of course, Moses, who writes this, knows about this because he wrote the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, as it is called. And he wrote, talking about the generations past. Moses wrote about Joseph and uh, Jacob and Isaac and Abraham going back in time in Genesis. He wrote about Noah and Enoch and Seth and Abel and Adam and Eve. Going all the way back to the very beginning, he knows, because he wrote by inspiration, that God, the one true God that he's speaking of here, is the refuge, a dwelling place for God's people, and that is to all generations. But not only that, he says here in uh, verse 2, Before there were mountains, before the earth was formed, from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God, or you are God, praising God for being eternal. God is eternal. Before there were mountains that were made, before the earth was formed, there was God. He always has been. He always will be. He is eternal in His nature. He never had a beginning, nor will He ever have an end. Now you think about the mountains, the mountains that were brought forth. You think about the mountains that were part of the original creation. They were probably very different than the mountain ranges that we have now. And then God destroyed the world with a flood. Again, Moses writes this about this in the book of Genesis. Genesis 6 through 9, that flood that came upon the earth and destroyed the earth, changed the very surface of our planet. And then when the flood went away, God caused mountain ranges to rise up and the valleys to go low so the water would come off. 
new mountain ranges. And when you go and you look at these mountains, it seems like these mountains will be there forever. It seems like they've been here forever. But that's not true. They formed. They had a beginning. And then you look at our earth and we, we see our earth and, and, of course, in our limited experience, we think, well, the earth has been here for quite a while. Well, it has been. It's not eternal. It's certainly not billions of years old. It's not millions of years old. It's several thousand years old, and that's a long time compared to our short lifetimes. But before those mountains were formed, before the earth was created, in Genesis 1 and verse 1, Moses wrote, In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God, the one who's from everlasting to everlasting. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God is in in an eternal refuge for His people. You know, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3 talks about the blessings of being in Christ. We have a refuge in Christ. Ephesians 1 and verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. That is our refuge. That is our dwelling place. And when a person has faith in Christ, repents of their sins, confesses that faith, they are baptized into Christ. They take refuge in Him, and He becomes their dwelling place where all spiritual blessings are found. Psalm 90, verses 3 through 12, in contrast to God's eternal nature, humans are mortal. Humans are mortal. Verses 3 through 12. And you turn to destruction. You turn men to destruction and say, Return, O children of men. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday, when it is past, and like a watch in the night. You carry them away like a flood. They are like a sleep. In the morning they are like grass which grows up. In the morning it flourishes and grows up. In the evening it is cut down and withers. For we have been consumed by your anger, and by your wrath we are terrified. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins, in the light of your countenance. For all our days have passed away in your wrath. We finish our years like a sigh. The days of our lives are seventy years, and by reason of strength they are eighty years. Yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger? For as the fear of you, so is your wrath. So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. God is eternal. He's always been, He always will be, but humans are mortal. We are subject to death. And the reason why we are subject to death is because of God's wrath. That is why we are subject to death. And in verse 3, he talks about turning man to destruction and says, Return, O children of Israel. And in verse 4 of Psalm 90, Moses says, A thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past and like a watch in the night. God created time, but He's not bound by time. He created it, but He's not bound by it. He exists outside of time and therefore a thousand years in his sight is just like yesterday just like yesterday to him he's eternal and we see in even in the new testament that peter talks about this in second peter chapter three the day of the lord is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day the lord is not slow concerning his promises he will carry it out he may not carry it out as quickly as we wish He may not do things on a time schedule that we think it ought to be, but God exists outside of time. It is not bound by time. And he goes on to talk about, uh, in verse 7, For we have been consumed by your anger, and in your wrath we are terrified. Consumed. The punishment that comes upon the wicked. Of course, Moses who writes this would be very familiar with this. Moses wrote about the punishments that God brought upon the people. Did he not write about the curse that was placed upon mankind in Genesis chapter 3? 
Because of man's sin, man was cut off from the tree of life and could not partake of it lest he live forever. Did not Moses write about the sins of the people becoming so wicked in the earth that he destroyed the world with a flood? Punishment, God's wrath. Did he not write about scattering the people by confounding their languages at the Tower of Babel, causing them to scatter throughout the world? A punishment. Did he not write about the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah and how he destroyed those wicked cities because of their wickedness? God's wrath upon those people. So Moses was very familiar with that. And Moses, who wrote Exodus, would be very familiar with God's wrath upon the Egyptian people, upon the Pharaoh for the affliction that they brought against God's people in enslavement. So God, through Moses, was letting them know, we know that we are consumed by your wrath. We know that your wrath, by your wrath, we are terrified, verse 7. And he says in verse 8, You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins, in the light of your countenance. God is very much aware of our sins, even the secret ones. That's why Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 and 14, that God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. And he says in verse 9 of Psalm 90, For all all our days have passed away in your wrath. We finished our years like a sigh. Our our age has been cut off. Man dies. And he talks about death there in verse 10. The days of our lives are 70 years at best. And if by reason of strength they may be 80 years. That is basically the average of human life span. Yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. Moses here is talking about, again, in the context, talking about God's wrath. Uh, We have a limited lifespan. And again, Moses, who's writing this, would be very familiar with it because he wrote about what happened to bring about death. Again, back to Genesis chapter 3. Man cut off from the tree of life so that he would not live forever in a state of sin. And as a result of that, man began to die. But even before the flood, men lived an average of over 900 years. Great expanse of life before the flood. Conditions on earth were very different than they are now. But after the flood, those ages began to diminish. Before the flood, you have someone that could live to be 969 years old like Methuselah and that would be considered an old man but by the end of Genesis you have Joseph dying as an old man at 110 years old something happened well the earth is different now the world was destroyed by a flood conditions on earth have caused our lives to diminish to 70, 80 years at best Some might make it to 90. I know a gospel preacher by the name of Perry Cotham. If he lives this year, he will be 100 years old. He has preached the gospel for 80 years. Hard to believe. But that is it. That's the maximum. Some may even make it a little bit beyond the century mark. But then we are cut off and we fly away. Cut off there is referring to death. That appointment that we all have, Hebrews 9 and verse 27. We're cut off and we fly away, and that shows that Moses understood that there is an afterlife. It's like the releasing of some some sort of being, an animal, a bird that's in a cage. You open the cage, it flies away. Our spirits leave this body in this life. And the New Testament, of course, talks about that. Luke chapter 16 We have Jesus talking about the rich man and Lazarus, both of them dying, both of their spirits departing from their body, but one in torment and the other in paradise, Abraham's bosom. And so there is a flying away. What did Jesus say to the penitent thief? Today, you will be with me in paradise. There is a flying away that takes place in death. The spirit departs from the body. And so he says there in verse 12, Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. That means we need to think about our mortality. We need to think about 
our life here on earth and what we're doing in light of God's will. Because life is short. James chapter 4 and verse 14, For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time, then vanishes away. And James in the context there says, We need to uh, say the Lord wills, we will do thus and so. It's like a vapor that's there, just like a morning fog that's there, but later on in the day it's burned off. It's gone. It is short compared to eternity. Though, therefore, we see the contrast there between God, who is eternal, to humans who are mortal and will die. Verses 13 through 17, God is compassionate. Psalm 90, verses 13 through 17, we see uh, that God is compassionate. Return, O Lord, how long? And have compassion on your servants. O satisfy us early with your mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days in which you have afflicted us, the years in which we have seen evil. Let your work appear to your servants and your glory to their children. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. So we see here that God in His wrath has caused us to live only a short time on this earth, 70, 80 years, that then we fly away. It's a result of the sin that our ancestors committed. Adam and Eve, but God is compassionate. God is compassionate, and Moses is calling out to God and asking for God's compassion to have compassion. Notice verse 13 on his servants, those who serve him, those who obey his will, those who do his bidding. You know, Psalm 103 talks about God has compassion and pity on those who fear him and keep his covenant. See, there's a condition there. The servants of the Lord are the ones who receive His pity. The servants of the Lord are the ones who are the recipients of His compassion. And he talks about uh, being able to rejoice in verse 14, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Serving the Lord and doing His will, having the compassion of the Lord will cause us to rejoice in our life. Verse 15, make us glad according to the days in which you have afflicted us. The years in which uh, we have seen evil. You see, the affliction and the hard times and the difficult times makes you appreciate the blessings that you have. The sufferings that we have in this world will help us to enjoy the blessings that God has in store for us for eternity. Who would appreciate a good night's rest? Would it not be someone who worked very hard and very diligently during the day, perhaps in the heat of the day in the summer or in the cold of winter, and they're worn out and they go to bed? Wouldn't that person enjoy a good night's rest more than the person that just sits around on the computer, maybe sits around and texts, doesn't do anything, just watches TV? The person who has worked very hard and seen difficulty is going to enjoy that rest more so than a person who has not put out much effort. And so we see here these affliction, these difficulties that we face, they help us to appreciate the blessings that God has for His people. Uh, Verse 16, Let your work appear to your servants and your glory to their children. Let this be for your servants and their children. Passing on these values to them is very important. And in verse 17, let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us. God's beauty seen in us. Is there not a song that we sing, let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me? The beauty of being a servant of God. Let it be seen. Let it be resting upon us. And establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Let our work be according to your will. And let it be established. Let it mean something. Let it have a purpose in this life. In Philippians 2 and verse 12, we're told to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. 
Have a life that is purposeful. Have a life that is meaningful. Let the Lord establish the works of our hand. Psalm 90, such a beautiful psalm. Talking about the compassion of the Lord, another psalmist says in Psalm 145 and verse 8, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. Psalm 90 talks about God being eternal. God uh, being the one who's from everlasting to everlasting. Psalm 90 also Moses talks about how man is mortal. And we are mortal because of sin. Because of the consequence that we have to face due to sin. And though we are mortal and we might live here just a short period of time, one day we will die and one day we will fly away. One day we're going to be brought into judgment for our activities. So we need to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Think about our mortality. Think about it in harmony with God's will. Then Moses writes about God's compassion and calls upon God to be compassionate to his people. To his servants. Question, are you a servant of the Lord? Are you a child of God? Are you a faithful Christian? You have an opportunity to to obey the gospel and become a Christian this morning. Believe in Jesus with all of your heart. Confess that he is God's son. Repent of all of your sins. And we have water available. We can baptize you, immerse you, into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Acts 2 and verse 38, Acts 22 and verse 16. If you've done that, you've gone astray, you're no longer serving the Lord as you ought. God in His compassion and mercy is giving you another day, another opportunity to repent. Let us number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. As always, the choice is yours. While together we stand and sing.